welcome to another episode of The Wellbeing Show. I'm Noel, Noel McDermott, your host, and I'm really, really excited to have with us tonight Michael Benjamin. Um, welcome, Michael. I'll sort of start chatting to you shortly. Um, Michael, who's one of the um, founders and one of the trustees of um, an extraordinary charity called Be Beyond, um, and he's got a very interesting story about the charity. It's a sort of mental health charity promoting sort of mental wellness and early intervention, particularly around young people um, uh, with uh, mental health issues, much needed at the moment. Um, and uh, just before we jump into that conversation, though, um, just want to remind people this is uh, a live podcast. Um, you can catch us on various streaming platforms, so on YouTube, um, Facebook Live, and on Twitter, on Periscope. Um, and it'd be lovely to hear from you. You can, my team is scanning the uh, airwaves, and if you have any comments, they'll sort of um, send them through to me. Or you can give us a call, uh, 07506 that's plus four four. Uh, 7506 319 um, So it'd be lovely to hear from you. Uh, enough of that. On to the more important thing. Um, Mr. Benjamin, Michael, nice Hi. to have you here. I've had your son on the show. Um, I met your son uh, a few years ago, actually, and um, nice, nice chap who's got an interesting story, which we'll get to know about. Um, uh, and I say that because um, Johnny, your son, is is our connection. Johnny had um, some challenges earlier in his life around mental health issues and um, has come through them and manages his uh, mental illness successfully, like lots of people with um, uh, severe and enduring mental health issues. And um, part of his story is um, his family, you're his dad, um, and how um, uh, sort of his family have um, uh, experienced sort of going through the mental health system or not, <laughs> being excluded probably most of the time. Before we get into that story, just um, I, I want to catch up at the moment um, uh, with people in terms of the last, you know, 18 months of the pandemic and um, how things have been for you and, and, um, and your wife and, um, and how are you feeling these days now that we're coming out of it and moving on? I think like everybody, it's been a, a difficult time. Um, oh, thank goodness we, we've been fine. Um, I haven't caught it and uh, had our jabs now. So uh, feeling a lot better. Um, um, but like everybody, uh, obviously, we hear of people that have suffered badly um, with with uh, um, with lockdown, um, with uh, not being able to lead a, a normal a normal life, um, and it has affected um, especially young people with uh, homeschooling. We hear about from, from the, through the charity and through other things. I've got. Two, two granddaughters as well. John has got an older brother. We've got two granddaughters that were off school, then on school, then out of school. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it, it, it's, it's been difficult for, for them um, and for homeschooling um, or trying to homeschool. Um, and so like everybody, um, we've started to go out. Um, I think we're still in a situation where we're not really going to the cinemas or, you know, want to go back to the theatre. But I think at the moment we're, we're, we're sort of in between looking about, are we going to do it? Are we going to do it? Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd be happy when we can get back to some sort of normality. Um, you seen your granddaughters? Are you back yeah, well, they live around the corner to us. Um, so we, we have seen them. But uh, obviously, when uh, the first lockdown came, uh, we, we didn't see them. And then, like a lot of other, we, we saw them through the window and, wow. and wave. And, and uh, um, we finally managed to get a cuddle from them um, uh, at, the, at the easing of the last, you know, a couple of months ago. Um, so, yes, it's, uh, but, 
you know, talking to other people who live, live far away from each other, it's 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 obviously more difficult. So we've been actually fortunate that uh, we have been able to uh, to see them, although not in the normal yeah. circumstances, you know. Um, and um, so hopefully we can start going out and and and, in, and enjoying them. I mean, it's odd when you say about that. Think about it visiting each other through um, the windows. And I remember, that, I remember that, but it does feel like it was a long time ago. It's, but it wasn't that long ago, was it? It wasn't that long ago that we were worried about any sort of contact with each other. And um, what a journey. Yeah, yeah it, it really has been a, a, a long journey. Um, and talking to other people, friends that uh, got parents in homes or you know they haven't been able to see them and even now it's been very 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 difficult so um it's affected so many so many different so many different people i mean i went out this morning and um you know when i'm in a, in a shop i still wear my face mask yeah um and, to be honest. yeah uh and not that i've been, been on transport but again okay they're, they're now saying about wearing it so I got used to it and, um, you know, I still wear my face mask, but I did notice uh, this morning, you know, there's quite a few shoppers not wearing face masks. And, um, but I still think, you know, in, in shops, um, uh, I still want to wear my face mask. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I'm also um, not so much the COVID stuff, although it's still possible to get it. Like, like you, I'm double jammed now. Mm. Um, and I'll probably get the third jab when it's offered. Um, so I'm, I'm in that age group, sort of. I'm in the age group where people offer me seats now. I'm a little <laughs> I bit ambivalent about that, I have to say. I, I know I know the feeling, yes. Yeah, yeah I, know. I remember the first time it happened, a, you know, a very polite young lady on the tube offered me a seat. And um, I, I sort of didn't take it. And I was sort of through gritted teeth being being nice to her but I mean she was just being nice but I was like yeah I sort no, of looked, I refuse to accept that I, uh, I sort of looked behind me thinking that, she, that the person was offering someone behind me yes. but it was me it was actually me <laughs> as well yeah um, um. <laughs> yeah it was it was me but actually I, I, my, I, I got a cousin of mine um her husband went to Wembley to the cup final oh, yeah. they've been double jabbed and he's got covid um and they think that he got it there but he's he said it's like it's like a, a cold now it's a nasty cold he's got a cough and he said yeah he, he's lost a bit of a, a taste as well but obviously because he's double jabbed um you know it's not hopefully as bad as obviously uh, yeah. that someone hasn't that hasn't been well, it, it's clear that the vaccines are doing the job that they said. They do exactly what they say in the tin. They reduce, reduce the chance of you getting severe COVID or dying from it. Yeah. They don't stop it, but they, they do a very good job. I have to say, I, I'm not sure if it's fashionable to say this, but I'm very proud of the way we've done things in the UK. We fumbled the ball at the beginning without a doubt, but now we're leading the world, I think, on... Yeah, listen, I, you know, obviously there's been mistakes made uh, along the way. Some probably could have been avoided, some couldn't have, but I think uh, no one knew how it was going to be. I mean, I, I, you know, we moved, uh, um, one of the people that downsized, we moved just before the the lockdown. You know, people talk, started talking about, uh, you know, this COVID and whatever, but obviously no one realised uh, I don't believe anybody could have realised how, how yeah. the, the effects that it had on on everybody. And uh, unfortunately, I think it's going to last way beyond the effects. Uh, but not actually COVID itself, but the, the effects of, of people's uh, uh, well-being. Um, it's going to take some time for it to to all come out and 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 and, and to you know the. the what, what it's done to, to, to people, not people that actually have caught COVID, because obviously uh, some of them obviously have suffered more than others. Um, yeah. uh, you know, um, but... but it's, uh, it's interesting for me talking to you about it because, um, I mean, your background is as um, a business founder, you're an entrepreneur and you set up 
business and, uh, around the fashion industry. Um, and um, you, you, you weren't trained to be aware by either by your work or your own childhood of um, mental health issues, were you? I mean, it wasn't. No, no, no not at all. I mean, it, we, I, I never, ever. Uh, and also uh, when, it, when uh, Johnny was uh, first, well, when he was diagnosed, when when because um, he had everything from us, it's it's now thirty, nearly thirteen, or so, just over thirteen years now. Yeah. And thirteen years ago, no one ever talked about mental illness at all. And I, I had no knowledge at all about anything that involved mental illness. Certainly didn't know anybody or hear of anything, and no one uh, say no one talked about it. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, 13 years ago, even areas like cancer, people talked in, in, a, in a quiet voice that, you know, and, and called it. Oh, so and that's obviously moved on. Uh, but no, I, I had no knowledge at all, uh, medical um, knowledge of, of anything to do with mental, mental illness at all. Yeah. And you, you were a successful businessman. You, you had two adult sons at that point um, who like you say, you provided and supported and um, you and your wife have done a great job bringing them up as um, their parents and sort of supporting them and helping them get on with their lives. Um, and I, I guess the stuff, um, just so I guess um, for people who don't know Johnny's story, I mean, his story is really very much out there. Um, and Johnny is one of those people who probably has done quite a lot as an individual to change our attitudes around mental illness. Um, and, and he's done a lot of work at taking away the stigma of talking about these things. Uh, we're not necessarily here to talk about him. I want to talk about the family experience more than anything. But just in your own words, tell us a little bit about Johnny's story so that people understand where... Yeah, yeah. Um... Johnny, um, as he was growing up, um, was there was never any issues at all um you know when it was uh, when he was at school uh we never had any issues about him um, saying he didn't want to go to school or um always was up to date with his work um when we went to open evenings uh the school the reports are always very good um and in fact our meetings were very short because there were never any issues um so obviously we thought everything was fine there was no no reason for us to think anything anything different um when um johnny then went to university um to manchester university and he he was studying uh, drama uh, there and uh, we went up to see him in a play in the December before the Christmas break. And the play was actually a, one of these very heavy, heavy plays. And when we saw him, we actually, had, although I, I, I had seen him because in business, I, I had to go to Manchester um, quite a lot uh, or near Manchester and used to meet up with him, have dinner with him. And it was just normal conversations. There was never any anything um, um, but we we had a we had a shock because he he he, he lost a lot of weight. He he he, he didn't look well at all. Yeah. Uh, but we took it down to um, university life, um, and the the play itself, the rehearsals and everything else. Um, and we thought we'd come home at Christmas and uh, everything would be fine. And that's. When, uh, when, when, if you like it here, because he came home and basically um, didn't really want to come out of his room uh, for, a, for a few days. And obviously we knew something was drastically wrong and yeah. um, didn't open the curtains at all. Um, and where we lived, we had a, a doctor um, a few doors away. Um, and even though it was 13 years, ago it was still as difficult making appointments with doctors as it is so it wasn't easy uh, so anyway we took we took him to the doctor and i don't think he was in there that long and she came out and said um he, he's, he's suicidal um and that was obviously a big shock to us i can imagine that must have been absolutely terrifying michael and she said he's got to go into a psychiatric hospital immediately 
Um, and she said, I've booked one in, I booked a bed in, in uh, one in Harrow. So we took Tony to um, the, the hospital. Um, and basically, as we arrived, they came out and uh, uh, literally took everything away from him um, um, and said, um, you know, he's suicidal, we're going to put him, which is the, you know, uh, a big shock into a, a suicide ward and um, again nothing we had no knowledge and basically all we were told was these are the visiting hours and and that was it um and if you want you can come have lunch with him um and that was it as far as we were concerned there was no help for us there was no helplines or if phone this number or contact this charity or whatever um and uh, literally uh, my wife and myself left the hospital and just sat in the car um and not knowing really what to do or who to talk to um absolutely shell-shocked to be yeah honest. absolutely because there was run over by a train sorry to mix the metaphors but I yeah can't imagine how difficult that like I'm, I'm actually trying to empathize with you in terms of sitting in that car I it just would have been unbelievable, I guess. Yeah, it, it was. Um, so what happened was we found um, uh, uh, Johnny's brother, um, who was older than him, and told him his first reaction was anger. Why Why didn't he let me know? Yeah. Uh, why didn't he speak to me? Uh, our reaction was guilt um, in the fact that uh, why did we not, notice why why did we not pick it up um and what happened was um it was actually just before christmas uh just a week 10 days before christmas yeah. and uh we then phoned up a couple of people friends and uh when we said that johnny's in hospital because the first reaction is has he had an accident yeah. um and cool. we didn't actually know how to tell people um uh, but it's, you know, one of the things I always say is that we've got lots of acquaintance, but you've actually got a small circle of what you can call close friends, and they're the ones you need to talk to. Um, so what happened was we, um, we, we, we did speak to a few people, trying to explain what the situation was. And um, um, one actually said, oh, well, our son suffers from anxiety, which they've never told us about previously um and um really that was it so, and we were going in to see him in in the, in the hospital and again um you know very little was said to us at all i mean no one actually said well this is what's going to happen or this is how we operate etc um and we actually had a meeting with johnny and and uh, one of the doctors psychiatrists there and he literally had a clipboard asking questions. We couldn't quite understand why I was looking up behind him. And um, uh, when we stood up, we saw there was a clock behind him. And so basically it was like, um, your time, and, that, and that's it. Um, and then what happened was that um, um, Johnny was, 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 was in hospital for a, a couple of weeks. And um, I was in London for, a, for a, a meeting and I got a call um, on my mobile which normally in the meeting I switch off but for some reason I hadn't switched it off and it was the hospital in Harrow to say John has run away from hospital mm -hmm. um, he's now in A&E in a London hospital um, and really didn't talk too much and just said that he was caught on a bridge and, and that was it uh, so I went to the hospital to find my wife who obviously uh, that again um we didn't know what to do um and uh johnny had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and and, and schizophrenia and, and i think i i decided not to look it up um because i just think some of these things you look up it's just frightening uh, and without anybody explaining what the whole situation is um and when I got to the hospital, it was January. All Johnny had on was a was a was a t-shirt, um, and uh, he really didn't know 
too much about what had happened. He, all he said was there was a someone that talked to him. And basically the police were there afterwards and uh, sort of took him to the hospital there. Uh, and again, um, when I got there, he was actually in a room by himself. And, and one of the nurses came in and said, oh, uh, help yourself to sandwich in the fridge. It's like, like well, you can have lunch. You know, previously, it's like, oh, you can have lunch with, with, with Johnny or have a sandwich. It's like, is that what everything is? And, and basically, I heard the doctor on the phone to, the doc, to someone in the, doc, in the hospital in Harrow saying, well, we need to section him. And I had no knowledge then of what section being section meant at all i mean you know uh, um and i just thought well it's it's you get a criminal record with that don't you and, and, and things like that but obviously i've learned now that it was for his own protection but again no one explained anything to us about what the situation was johnny went back into into hospital um he said you know he always says that um um things sort of changed for him after he met a stranger who talked him out of, you know, um, jumping. And um, obviously it's, 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 it's a, 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 a long story because it, it, it's, it's a journey, uh, basically. And uh, what happened was that gradually Johnny came home for a day then, then a couple of nights and gradually uh, he came out of, he came out of, of hospital we didn't talk about it we we didn't talk about anything he didn't want to talk about it no one really talked to us of what to say or how to approach it i mean obviously now we know it's okay to say how are you um but no one we thought if we say how are you it may yes that'll trigger him trying to kill himself again That's... yeah yeah. The common belief, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It is a common belief. Um, I mean, obviously, thank goodness things have moved on. But what happened was um, that Johnny um, um, gradually started to see people, friends. Um, again, he's got a, a great group of friends from, that he made at school, um, and they've been very good uh, with him. Um um, he actually uh, told us afterwards that he that he took himself off to cams um, without us knowing. Yeah. Um, and again, the waiting list, um, which nowadays is is just as bad to be honest with you. Um, the waiting list uh, was and he just gave up. Um, and also his uni friends when at, uh, when he was. At, the housemates knew of what what had happened um but again he told them not to say anything to us yeah and again he you know they're they're, they're, they're still his friends um um which is which is great um they've all stood, stood by him and um and, and i think that that that's helped as well um and then what happened was he then gradually without us knowing did uh uh, you know, he, he he made films about what had happened and um um and, and people had seen it and and again came back and said well that's happened to me as well and this has happened to me as well um and as i say we we didn't really talk about it and then what happened was that uh, a friend of mine was diagnosed um with prostate cancer and he said to me have you ever had a test i said no you know and he said well you should do uh, and i did and uh, they said, yeah, you know, they, they said, um, you know, that you need, you need, you've got it as well and you need to have treatment. And that's, I think, really changed a lot uh, for, our, for us as well in the fact that um, uh, the help that you can have with, in, in the hospital, I was given books, but yeah. the nurses, yeah. phone this number if you need any help. This is a helpline if you really feel this. Phone Samaritans and whatever. Um, so, um, and what happened was, I, you know, I could talk about to Johnny and his brother about what treatment I was going to have, and we thought, well, if we could talk about physical health, then we should be able to talk about mental. So it actually, actually, um, 
it enabled us to start talking. But actually what we found also was, um, is it's very difficult sometimes to talk face to face. So we used to talk in the car or walking yeah, that's uh, and have a conversation. Um, and it's moved on, but also Johnny then started obviously the campaign um, um, and, and started to work and, and Neil, who uh, was the guy that, they started talking uh, actually before uh, they started talking and and um, telling people what had happened and I think you know people listen or they, they listen because um, it, it's lived in experience and people can relate to, to somebody that, um, that that has experience and and, and then, then, then not knowing anything um, and he said to me, well, why don't we start talking about how it affects family? Because it does affect the family, um, no doubt about yeah. it. I'm going to go, I mean, thank you for sharing that. I mean, uh, sort of, I know the story, and even though I know the story, both yours and and Johnny's, I'm, my, I'm still, my jaw is dropping and hitting the floor at the lack of support and lack of sensitivity to your needs. Um, and I mean, you say it's changing, but maybe not as much <laughs> as that. I, I'm with you, I, I'm, I'm, I tend to be a half a glass half full person, but um, unfortunately I think uh, your experience, which is what I want to focus on this evening, is still very common. Um, and before we talk about that experience and what you are doing to change that, um, can we just, um, I, I just want to explain some terms that you've used, which I understand them well, but I'm not sure everybody else will. So, for example, sectioning, CAMs, stuff like that, and uh, schizophrenia. These are words no. that, like, seriously, you don't get taught in school, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you suddenly come across this, this terminology. And it, I, I was really, I mean, what you said about... Um, uh, sort of your impression of sectioning was, oh, that's that's like the criminal justice system, isn't it? You're a criminal, and and that's really fascinating because I think that's exactly what the experience is like. Now, sectioning, so that people understand it, means a, a part of a piece of legislation that is called the Mental Health Act is used. A section of the Mental Health Act is used to determine services for somebody who has. Uh, mental illness um, and specifically there are two sections of the mental health act which are well known to people wh who have them applied to them which are sections two and sections three and section three in particular um, relates to the involuntary application of treatment to somebody who's a risk to themselves or others um, now the fascinating thing about it is that you can be deprived of your liberty and have treatment imposed upon you using that section without going to court, right? And, yes. and without being found guilty of a crime. Now, if we all understand, I guess, if we're found guilty of a crime, that we may end up in prison, um, having our freedom removed from us. But we would expect, and we have a right, a legal right to expect that, there's a, a legal process that we go through where we have a, a solicitor, um, you know, the police are meant to tell us what the charges are, they're meant to tell us about our rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And absolutely, that does happen to some extent in uh, mental health sections, because of course people get advocates and it's very legal, but the family, absolutely nothing whatsoever. And, and it's not, I don't think it has moved on from the clipboard wielding mental health professional, not just doctor these days, it would be other people who are looking at the clock, um, doing their tick box interview with the family. Yeah. But actually they've just got to get back on the ward and they've got a lot of really important and busy things to do. And that hasn't changed so much. And I, the reason I say that is not because I'm cynical, it's just that prior to the pandemic, I went to the Houses of Parliament to the review, the mental health subgroup um, that was looking at the review of the Mental Health Act in England. Um, and 
only at that point, and this is two years ago, was the Mental Health Act updated to require mental health services to seek the views of family and or other important relationships to the patient. And that's only two years ago. So not much has changed in 13 years. No, the only thing that's, well, what, what has changed is that people now realise that, that the family can help. Um, and also the family need help as well, because uh, it affects, it affects your, your lifestyle um, and how, how you cope. I think what's helped is some of the charities um, have the helplines now, and they've added helplines for for, for parents and siblings and, and uh, etc so that I think moved on I agree with you uh, 100% and you know that there, it, it, there's there's a long way to go um, and I think what's happened with COVID it, 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 it's actually put it back um, well yeah now you can get sections um, currently because they've changed the legislation during yeah. COVID to make it easier to section people yeah, and also even meeting now. I mean, it's it's like we're on Zoom, but um, you know, on, on Zoom, and and obviously people were missing out on the one to one uh, basis and 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 help as well. Um, I do some work with we have a a fathers forum, and again we hadn't been able to meet. It's a it's a, it's a support group. Um, and we hadn't been able to meet and it's it was on it was on zoom we actually met a couple of weeks ago in a park uh there were 10 of us um i'm i'm yeah so it's it's missing that one-to-one -one. but i i agree with you i mean there's still a lot to to be done and and uh i think the, the only the if you if you good thing I don't know if that's the right word uh but at least people are now talking and uh and being able to uh to open up um well, although there's still there's still to stigma honest, about Mike, people are only talking because people like yourself have started the conversation that's that's the truth here and I think people need to be realistic about mental health um services is that if you want support um, you're going to have to go to the groups that people like yourself have set up. That's a fact. You know, yes. it, it's, it's so, and even with some of the large mental health charities now, they are, and Johnny would agree me, with me on this one, they're so in the pocket of their funders these days that sort of, it, it's, you know, in terms of what do they do? Um, and I remember, anyway, I'm not going to get into the politics of it. I could have... <laughs> Johnny and I, when we meet, we have these long rants about it. But I want to, like, um, what's, what's interesting for me is because I, I think people think that mental health is somehow linked to um, certain type of social circumstances, for example. So that somebody becomes schizophrenic because they have a certain type of life experience. And, of course, that's not true. There may be a higher, there may be a higher incidence because of stress factors, but it's stress that causes these breakdowns and 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 it could be stress from going to university for example which is what it sounds like happened to johnny yeah i mean i think at the moment now the whole issue of transition is 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 a is a big problem um exactly. i know even you know with the younger people and that's why obviously for us and you mentioned turkey you know great believer in early intervention because if johnny would have had help when he was younger obviously um wouldn't come to the stage you know where where, where he was um so and let's let's think about because i know he went you said he went to cams and for people that don't know cams is the uh, mental health services for children and adolescents okay so it stands for children and adolescent mental health services yeah. c-a-h-m-s um and um sort of again it's it, it is what it is and i could spend hours you know, we could spend hours um, sort of... It could, it, 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 it could be an hour, an hour programme on its own. It's like, let's not waste our time. Yeah, but absolutely. Johnny's story is very familiar to me, that he went... Well, it's, it's unusual that a young person actually sends himself to it, but, you know, it's, what's his, the response he got, which was, oh, this is going to take too long, I can't be bothered, um, is a very familiar... Mm. Um, 
thankfully what's going on at the moment is that in terms of the intervention issue the government are funding other services rather than camp so they now have a, a system in place which i think and i again i'm sure you would agree with which is direct support in the schools so they're yes. supporting the school environment to understand mental health issues more and i guess you would argue that that's the way forward yes yeah absolutely um you know um i think the schools are now taking it on board some schools are better than others um, they have counsellors now, um, and they certainly take it. I think it's, it's, it's the well-being as well, not just the mental health, but the whole thing, issue of, of, of well-being in, in schools as well. And I think it's actually um, teaching young people to open up, and, and if they don't feel well, or they, they, they don't, you know, to, to, to be able to talk about it. Yeah. Um, and you know, we we do do talks at schools. Um, not me personally; they're not going to listen to me. Uh, but certainly, our our young young board that go in and, and talk to schools, and that they do listen. And I think again, it's 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 people that have life experience as against someone to be honest with you, reading from a book yeah. and being able to explain. Okay, um, and also young people talk about bullying and, and social media or lots of different areas um so yeah i think it's that early intervention so yeah it, it takes time to train up these people um but i think it, it's it is going the right way um um because there is a, obviously we can talk about cams and whatever but as we know the problem is that once somebody gets to a certain age they drop it they drop out so what happens then um well what so, i'm interested in is this thing because um, I mean, this this idea, like Johnny ended up in this system that basically locked him up, mm. and, and and even under the, with the best will in the world, it's then difficult to imagine how you would then view that service as a support and a partner in your recovery. You'd have to go on quite a long emotional maturity journey yeah. to understand that, right? And there is still, I think, for a lot of people, a fear. That if they ask professionals with for help around their mental illness, that that's the response they're going to get is having their freedom taken away from them, which is not true. The vast majority of people are not. Over ninety percent of people who present to adult mental health services uh, never come back to them, not because they're afraid of them, but because they don't need to. Yes. Um, so uh, it's but but it's difficult to imagine now. It seems to me obvious in that sort of situation that the people who actually can provide a less invasive support are the family, the friends, yes. the, 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 the mates at school or at university. And, and it, actually, if you want to work with somebody who is distressed and has serious psychological distress, it seems like obvious to me that you'd work with those people because that's where the person with the distress is going to, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, that, that's um, the, the involvement of the family, um, you know, that don't sideline them, um, which is what happened. Um, and it's still happening, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's, again, if physical and mental illness, uh, if someone is, again, suffering from cancer or, or whatever illness then the fam the family unit is there uh and they talk as a family unit yeah. um when it's McMillan who do a fantastic job um um they talk about family and and help for the family and, and uh etc um it but i don't know for the mental health side they they they, they, they seem to sideline it is bizarre i'm, I'm with you it is bizarre because um, like in every other, like if you've got an elderly parent, for example, and before anybody says I'm elderly, shut up, right? Well, I'm with you there. <laughs> yeah, right. Don't, don't offer me a seat on the train. No. Shut up, leave me alone. No, if you see but, me, if you see me, let me stand. Yeah, quite. Um, but, but you know, we, we, in, in support of our elderly, for example, we, we totally get it that we're now engaging with family for support because, um, you know, we, we can't, 
don't want maybe the social services to take over everything and where families can't yes we want that extra support but as much as possible the quality of life is improved um if if, if it's somebody that you know that is supporting on a day-to-day -day basis well we know that for a fact we still haven't done that with mental health services i mean it's no. sort of it's beyond me as to understand what the objection is and what the block is. I, 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 I don't know. I have to say, you know, Tony, um, you know, still um, has help, um, yeah. you know, and um, he has a psychiatrist now that she is fantastic. Um, you know, we know <laughs> she's always going to be late because she takes her time. She listens. Um, and when you can have a face-to-face -face meeting, um, you know, my wife or myself go with, we're not in the room when, when she talks to him, but she calls us in afterwards and just has a five minutes or 10 minutes with us. And, uh, you know, how, you, how, how, how her, her first question is, how are you? <laughs> um, and then just, just a general talk. And, uh, you know, uh, we're very proud of what, John has achieved, uh, but sometimes he overdoes things, and uh, that's when he, he suffers because lack of sleep, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's when she says, says to us. Yeah. Also, there, there's a, a big difference, unfortunately. Uh, you know, uh, the nature of, of, of the illness John has had, had relapses and had to go back into hospital. Yeah. Uh, but the difference is that. Um, we actually saw her when he was in hospital and she was actually just being in to see Johnny and the first words were, he'll be okay. Yeah. And, and, and basically that's what you need to help. He said, he needs his rest. Um, you know, um, he's got to catch up with his sleep. He needs his rest. That's what he's been overdoing it. Um, but that those just that small sentence made such a difference to but us. It's Treating as a human being, isn't it? So yeah, exactly. Exactly. Coming coming to that because I, I think the interesting thing for me is um, having talked to you and talking to you now is um, that is you know that question how are you because I think parents maybe in particular forget to ask themselves that yeah because they're focused obviously we understand this they're focused on their kid and help them and that may also be true of the boyfriends and the girlfriends and the husbands and the wives and the children of the person who has who is what we call the identified patient and um, and that can be quite destructive losing that ability to focus on your own needs what was your experience like around that michael well yeah um you did feel that you were being ignored um and um, it, it, it was an experience very difficult, uh, very difficult because you were ignored. Um, no one took uh, how you were uh, yourself. Um, and we had great support from friends, uh, which was which was great because you had some support. And not everybody has that, unfortunately. So it's the support that, that we, we, we didn't have the support from, um, uh, for, from doctors or hospitals or whatever. We didn't have, we didn't have that. Uh, and I think that would have helped us. Uh, not only think it, it would have helped us. Yeah. And I think it also I know would, have it helped, would have helped you. I don't think. I absolutely yeah, know it yeah. would have helped. It would, it would have helped us. <laughs> yes. Also to understand. Um, exactly. Because to have things explained uh, to you. Yeah, to understand because like any illness, it, it's, a, it's a journey. Some, some take longer than others. And no one explained, well, this is, you know, what's going to happen. Um, okay, like with any illness, doesn't always follow the, the, the pattern that they say, but at least it gives you an idea of what of what what the situation is. I, I spoke to someone this, this week, actually, and uh, his son's been in hospital, and it, it really mirrored Johnny because basically he said, oh, he's coming home for a day, and then this, and I said, oh, this is what happened. And he went, oh, right, okay. Now, that wasn't explained. I, you know, I could explain, okay, this is really what happened with Johnny. And he said, oh, right, okay. So I said, yeah, I said, then and he came home and spent an evening uh, at home. And then gradually 
And uh, and again, uh, I mean, what you said before as it moved on, it has moved on to the extent that people are talking about yeah. mental illness now. It's moved on because there are uh, charities, some of the smaller charities that are doing a fantastic job, local local charities as well. Um, but the there's still not the help for explaining the journey and what you can expect um whatever you know he wasn't told what he can come home maybe for an evening or, or whatever and, and that's where i said you know we've got the support and you have this you need the support around you and my experience of working with the families and like i i mean i you know i'm really rigid about it I, I sort of very rarely work with the identified patient on their own because i know it's it's like setting off a bomb um not because the person wants the bomb to go off, but that's what happens is this emotional bomb happens. And, and one of the things that I often hear, I don't know if you experience this as well yourself as a father, there's a tremendous sense of guilt and shame. And mm. have I failed? Should I have known more? Should I have done something sooner? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then a lot of stress about the unknown stuff and, and maybe anxiety and depression yourself. Um, because you begin to feel overwhelmed. Does that resonate with you as a sort of... Oh, absolutely, 100%. Uh, you know, you, you, you said, you know, you, you, you feel guilty. Um, why didn't I know? Um, and yes, you get stressed. I think also, uh, you know, um, you know, I was in business, so, you know, I, I, I did a lot of traveling. Um, so I suppose, you know, I was a little bit removed in, 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 in some ways uh, or another, but there's always that, that, that worry there uh, as well. You know, if I was away, you know, is anything happening while I was away or, or whatever? Um, so yeah, it's that, it's that support. And, and yes, you do, you feel guilty. You feel, um, why did I not notice? Why did I not see? um yeah johnny hid everything from us and you know even now you you think back and go well should i is there anything i should have seen that i didn't see and uh, i'm often of, often asked that question and you think back and think i don't know um i don't think so but i don't know i mean it's seriously with with things like schizophrenia in young people, it just looks like a, a, an angry, withdrawn teenager. So prodomal symptoms look like being a teenager, and it's yeah. very difficult to know, to be honest. But 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 the, um, the the interesting thing I think is 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 that I think you can do something that uh, other people can't, who maybe are qualified in the field, which is this lived experience stuff. Because when I'm listening to you, I know absolutely from how you're talking that you've been through this, right? And, and it's coming from your heart, um, what you're talking about. And you're still living through it in many ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're still living through it. Um, um, it, it it's, it's there. Um, but I think, um, you know, talking to other people as well they want to give something back and, and help other people yeah. uh, as well You're not trying to do anything great or whatever it's just that uh, if you you know it, 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 and it's like the young board that we have in the charity they're all there for a reason um and um for, for various different reasons and they they want to give something something back and and, and talk about and things I mean, I think it is still the case. I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong. We're of a similar generation, I think, and a similar mindset, um, uh, sort of independence. But certainly I was brought up. I mean, it's not the way I am with my son, but I was brought up to understand that my role as a dad was to more maybe go and, you know, shoot the wildebeest and drag him home, not necessarily to be there, you know, um, and all that. And, and you were off successfully setting up your business and and we you and I were definitely not brought up to have emotional intelligence and we've acquired it and it's still the case I think with a lot of guys that oh I, absolutely and you know talking to different support groups um as well and there's a lot of support groups that have, have opened up because they found that, 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 that it, it does help to be able to talk uh to people um 
And I know when we give talks, actually, probably 75% of the audience are women, uh, mothers, um, sisters, and, and, and whatever. Um, men still don't turn up as much as, uh, as women. And I know with the support group, we started this father's uh, support group, Father's Forum, because um, they, they had a parent support group and no fathers ever went. That's right. Absolutely. That's it. Because men don't open up and talk. Yeah. Um, it's the same with toddler and, and parent groups. They're not toddler parent groups. They're toddler and mum groups. <laughs> yes. Do you know, that's just a fact, isn't it? You know, yeah. you turn up and that's the way it is. Yeah. Yeah, but I think now with the, with this, um, the, the group that, uh, that I'm on, the, everybody's on a WhatsApp, so there's support there. Um, I mean, we're not professionals. We're not going to give professional advice, but in some cases, we've we, some of us have been through a journey earlier than other people. And so we can signpost or say, you know, well, uh, uh, and, and I think that's where um, it's, 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 when we when we do talks and we then get the questions and i think it's i, I say it has moved on but you made a point it has it moved on that much i think when we sat in that car that time we hadn't we didn't know where where to turn to and i think what people now really need is, is where they can get help and, and signpost yeah. not it's not to see you know it's it's basically a, a support and whatever and i think that's where um there still needs a lot of work to be done i mean i, th I think one of the thing is what i'm hearing you saying i think this is correct is that uh, even if the services aren't in place maybe we've got to the point where people understand they have needs and certainly 13 years ago you didn't even know you had needs you were just no. shell-shocked um, uh, but maybe, hopefully, we've raised the bar a bit to the point where people go, I need more information, I need more help, I need to go and find something that will help me. And, and if families are doing that, that's brilliant, because help-seeking behaviour is the beginning of healing, you know. And, and Johnny will tell you this as well, because he had a very angry response to mental health services, and now he doesn't. And I know recently during the pandemic, he decided to admit himself into hospital. Now, because he decided to admit himself into hospital, his stay there was less traumatic, shorter, more successful. You know all of this, don't you? you know, yes. And, and yes. if we get family on board, that's what we get. Those are the outcomes we get. We get people who aren't traumatized by the experience. But thinking about guys in particular, now there is a gender difference between men and women when it comes to mental illness. And in general, it tends to be men get the more severe and enduring mental health problems as the type that's Johnny's got. Whereas women tend to get more of the more common mental health problems, anxiety, depression, and not less severe or not less serious, but they are managed in very different ways. So men are technically or statistically more likely to end up in these hospital settings because they have these types of illnesses and so the sort of work that you're doing I think is absolutely central to transforming these services because I think it's really interesting and again we're gonna to have to finish and maybe I'm finishing on a sort of polemic note but I think it's really interesting that the primary delivery of mental health services to men which is these psych hospitals are more like prisons. It's more like a prison service. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I, I think yeah, I think you're you're, you're right. Um, Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think I think you're right. Um, you know, I think there there are those cases. I mean, you know, I think unfortunately, but that's why you know, for us, early intervention um, is 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 just so vital now. So the key things are learn about it go and talk to people who've experienced it if you're a guy you really need to go and talk to other men about this stuff you know if you're a dad go and meet father's groups like the one that you set up michael um, and talk to other guys because it's your sons that might end up in this system and, and no, it's, it's, you know it's a mixture on our father group it's a mixture of, of, of daughters and and sons so it's, it's not just um yeah. but it's it's a case of talking and having support and being able to open up yourself because as you say 
older generations <laughs> never never i mean even you know fathers are younger than us um were never taught to, to talk about it uh or exactly. try, to open about i think it, it it's it's good now that uh that that people i mean i mean I, i'm not going to mention any names now but you know you, you get like the sportsmen unfortunately that, that are suffering um and obviously uh, you know the bars in the olympics is, is suffering yeah. and you get a commentator a well-known commentator saying she's let the country down i, I mean, mean that that to me is, is, is just unbelievable it, it's just so damaging to 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 other people because they think well we better not say anything because this is the type of thing people no, people will you think know this. what's amazing about these young athletes is that they are you know like the the tennis player the japanese tennis player recently did it etc cetera, etc cetera. and also people like Meghan markle they've just gone you know what i'm going to put my mental wellness first and forget you and the career and your expectations oh. and all that sort of stuff and they're brilliant they're absolutely right uh, well absolutely so uh, you know that, that that's where those type of people need to just <laughs> go away because basically they don't help the help the situation we are getting through to younger people now to talk um but when you get idiots like that who uh actually don't, don't help um because well, people they, people well, you know, yeah. people think that, that they're letting people down when, when they're not you know it's it's not something you can see it's not like someone's broken a leg or anything like that you know it's internal um yeah. and it's it it's there, you know, and you, you've got to uh, look after the, the, these people. Yeah. And also, to be honest, and, and you know this, part of the symptoms of these illnesses, the mental illnesses, are you do feel like you're a failure. And the last thing in the world you need is some idiot coming along and reinforcing that feeling because you're already feeling like killing yourself. You don't need some prat to say, yeah, you should kill yourself. I mean, it's like, uh, I, I'm really angry about it. I mean, I sort of feel a bit like the people who are in public positions need to be held accountable for consequences. Um, and without a doubt, having public figures who have uh, an authoritative platform, who are given an authoritative platform, are increasing the numbers of people who harm themselves and kill themselves as a result of what they're saying, and yeah. actually need to be held accountable for it. I, I agree, they need to be held accountable for In the same I way think... that if that person was to make obviously hateful statements, they could be prosecuted. I would like to get to the point where making obviously statements that are going to put people's health and well being at risk should also be a prosecutable offence, to be honest. Um, yeah, because also, and also they should be taught. Um, maybe they need to speak to people that suffer or, or they should be taught. Um, I think know, the person we're talking about is not open to learning. No, you're right. Anyway, you're right. Anyway, so yeah, I just think, you, don't give them a platform. Maybe no, you're right. Them, you're right. Get just, rid of them. Just, just leave them out. But I think, you know, just going back, if you like, this whole thing of, of early intervention and, and, and the, so it, it helps young people to what we're very, I mean, it, it's it's surprised that, but also ha, you know, pleased about is that when we do talk to young people, they are much more open uh, and talking about it. And I think that that's where it has moved on. Okay. It hasn't moved on as far as the family, as much as I would like to see. I like, you know, obviously, you know, and we did a talk somewhere where the parents were there with the young people and young people were very open. I think it was a shock to the, to the, to the adults there and the parents. I've seen that. I've seen it happen these days. Like, a lot of parents don't realise just how sus their kids are around this stuff. Absolutely, and it was it was it was fantastic. So exactly. I think we need to involve that a lot more, and also with schools as well. Okay, when you've got young ones, but when you've got uh, teenagers or, or, or yeah, involve the parents and 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 the young people, so we can all learn. I mean, you know. Uh, We've had to learn the hard way, um, but if, if if the parents are there and, and they can talk together, and it then like us, uh, with Johnny and myself, you know, we we talk 
like driving along or, or you know so open a conversation and have a conversation and uh, put 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 the telephone put put the mobile down or something when you're having dinner or something have have a conversation and i think you know if the schools and other things involve you know young people and the parents so everybody's involved as well and we we could all we can all learn you yeah. know from each other no no doubt in my mind and i we are at the end of the show unfortunately i told you the hour goes quickly and nobody <laughs> believes me how quickly it goes but yeah. it does. um what's the best way for people to un- get in touch with uh, where can they go for information about what you do if you if you go on to our our charity we are beyond www we are beyond you, you'll you'll find out what what we're, so what one we're word, doing. we are beyond dog. yeah uh, and and basically it gives more information about about the charity okay. uh, i give you a very quick idea last year during the lockdown covid we did a schools festival and basically yeah. we we were looking about 200 schools we ended up with 1200 schools and we provided free well-being lessons for for okay. children and for teachers because teachers are suffering as well um and we're planning another one for this february I, as well. I, if you don't mind just before we finish, i'm going to make another get on one of my other soapboxes i mean i know there's a lot of people that talk in the uk about we should have funded this and funded that and funded this and and i you know i agree with that we need more funding in mental health services i agree with that but actually they can't do what people like you do and when, when, when people say we shouldn't be funding charities to go in and do the work that the hospital should, to be honest, the hospital responses aren't great and they never will be. You could, you could put 10 times more money into hospitals and you'll still get problems because they're hospitals. And whereas if we actually put the money into what you're doing, we'll get real outcomes. Well, I think I think yeah, absolutely. Because okay, the hospitals need the money, but the hospitals are the last. You know, it's when people are in a bad in a bad way. So literally, it's 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 the last part. It's we have to work to get people that aren't going to go to hospital. I mean, that's why we're having the COVID jabs to stop people going into hospital. Yeah, exactly, and, and, it, and basically, it's exactly the same. It's on... not going to happen by some professional that you don't know turning up and knocking on your door. End of story. Yeah, it's because. Somebody you know in the area that you live advises you to do it. That's how it works. I'm going to finish off on this. I mean, I, you know, um, it's a real pleasure to talk to you. I remember last time I had Johnny on, I said, oh, we were chatting afterwards and we were both decompressing after getting on various soapboxes, it has to be said. Yeah. And I said, I just, you know, like I'd really love to meet your family. So, right, we'll get you, my, get my dad on the show. And um, it seems to me that. Johnny is really lucky to have you as his dad. Well, I think we've, you know, to be honest, we've, we've learned a lot from Johnny uh, as well. Um, That's what and, makes a good parent, mate. Uh, and also the people that we met through Johnny as well have been quite quite amazing. Um, just very quickly, someone that was actually in, ho- in hospital first time with, with, with Johnny, uh, we were at... Um, a, a, a charity uh, function uh, uh, do mental health and this guy came up to me and he said to me how are you and you don't remember me do you so I said no I'm sorry and he said I was actually in hospital when Johnny was in hospital in Harrow so I said how are you now so he said yeah he said I've again <laughs> talk about this journey so I said what are you doing so he said well he said I, I actually finished taking my exams he said i'm now qualified solicitor and he said i work in mental health now he said because he said people are uh, you know they, they they don't know about law it's like you talked about being sectioned and things like that so again we've met some amazing amazing people as well and and um you know that actually gives you hope because it, Someone like that, again, has overcome his difficulties. He, he said, you know, I still have some issues. He said, but he said, and he's giving back, again, um, help, yeah. uh, because he had some help. So I think, uh, uh, you know, I think that's, that. I'll talk about help, but that's what's helped us, I think, as well, is, is seeing people out there. 
Thanks, Michael. You're not allowed to respond to what I'm just about to say. I'm going to say something positive about you again. You're going to have to be silent and accept it, and then the show will end. Um, Johnny's lucky to have you, you as a dad, and the people that you work with are lucky that you come into their life. The definition of a good parent, I think, is somebody who learns and from their kids and from other people to do the best that they can. Um, and when you have difficult times like you did, when you felt like you totally failed, you stepped up, mate. And that's really, really impressive. You can't answer back, Michael. You just have to sit there quietly and accept the compliment. There you go. I really admire you. And I'm really touched that you've been on my show. Thank you very, very much. We have to finish there. So stay there, Michael. Um, we have to finish tonight, folks. I don't want to finish. It's just I get in trouble if I keep going on, even though actually this particular show I could do for the next few hours easily. Um, but I'll get in trouble because... James will have to edit this down to one hour so we can go on the men's radio website, stuff like that. But bye-bye for now. See you all uh, next week. Have a great week, folks. And um, yeah, Michael, stay there.